So your role in the, the fund manager over how, however many years mm -hmm. started becoming the guy that was going to the Utah Jazz games, you know, <laughs> court side, traveling, going uh -huh. to Dubai, meeting with the big investors. Mm -hmm. if, if you could give just a brief highlight of that, you know, what is that like? What is it like to brush shoulders with, you know, royalty and... Well, and... I, I'll tell you this, it doesn't work mm -hmm. if you're like Googling all over them, right? right? <laughs> You, you, you have to, you have to treat them just like they put their pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else, mm -hmm. you know, now a mutual respect for who they are, for who I am, et cetera, is super valuable, you know, but you know, I had, I had the NBA players at my house a lot of times mm -hmm. and they came cause it was a cool, fun place to hang out. And I wasn't, I never was like, Hey, can we get a selfie together? Not mm -hmm. once. Even the first time I met him, I never got selfies. People are like, why don't you have more pictures with you and Rudy Gobert or Donovan Mitchell, all these guys? I says, because I, I wasn't that guy. I didn't care. Mm -hmm. You know, if they want a picture, they could take one with me. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. And so, so yeah, it was, it was, and, and it, we've had such an amazing opportunity to connect with such amazing people. And I will tell you that getting into that world it's a very small group it's super amazing how many of the power players of the world are all connected mm -hmm. you know and so be right before covid uh, vanessa and i were in a different country almost every other week um we were speaking to royalty and world leaders and and um big billionaires and change makers about the charity work we were doing and helping change laws and create awareness, which was super powerful. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we still have this beautiful real Rolodex. I mean, we've had, we've had royalty fly in and stay at our home, but you know what? They're just regular people. This is back mm -hmm. to where we started mm -hmm. in the conversation. You have to understand you, every single person listening to this podcast, every single person are just as powerful, just as beautiful, just as divine as billionaires and royalty and world leaders, I promise you. I don't care if your job is is being a street sweeper. Mm -hmm. I love and value you as an infinite being of power and light just as much as I do these people I know who are royalty. Mm, that's powerful. And so if that wasn't enough, you know, being a, the fund manager of a multi-billion dollar real estate fund, you were also moonlighting. Uh, you were 007, you know, <laughs> under, you know, secret operations. Yeah. What What's that about? Well, I'll tell you this. I'll mm -hmm. start it out with this mic drop story. Okay. So, um, out of Vanessa, you can look her up. She's a f pretty famous actress in Colombia. She was in all the TV series at the time. And mm -hmm. a long time ago, she, her face was in posters and stuff. Awesome. We met in Haiti. Mm -hmm. I was... Uh, doing some stuff with anti-child trafficking in Haiti, and she was donating her time to the orphanage in Haiti. And so I tell people meeting a beautiful Colombian actress is kind of cool, but when she's donating her time at an orphanage in Haiti, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Oh, yeah. And here's my mic drop. You ready? <laughs> so Henry Cavill, mm -hmm. look him up. He's the actor who plays Superman. Mm -hmm. Henry was at Vanessa's work almost every other day, mm -hmm. almost every day. They started dating, and then she met me. Mm -hmm. I stole Superman's girlfriend. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> that is the mic drop. <laughs> now, you're not going to find pictures of them online. But the, the, you have to and then ask yourself, mm -hmm. why would somebody of her caliber mm -hmm. that literally could have anything she wanted? Mm -hmm. I mean, she's she's got Superman wanting to date her. In fact, in her phone, mm -hmm. he had his, his name was in there as Henry Cavill, my future husband. Wow. Changed it to Henry Cavill, the fake Superman. Oh. <laughs> so then the question is, mm -hmm. what did I have to do in my life mm -hmm. to get myself to the point where I qualified for a woman like that, mm -hmm. right? That could literally have anybody she wanted, but she chose me. What was it? Was it the money? Actually, it wasn't the money at all. In fact, I have some beautiful stories. I'm going to tell two of them just because they're awesome. We, um, when we first started dating, we had to go to a gala. And she didn't even have a gala dress. She was a former actress, but she didn't even have a gala dress. And so we went to a store and I found a dress. It was a beautiful gala dress. It was a little over $2,000. Mm -hmm. And she looks at the tag. She knows I can afford it, right? She said, Paul, what's the average cost of rescuing a child? And I said, average cost is about $2,000. Mm. She said, I'm not wearing a child. Mm. She said, you can buy me a $200 dress mm -hmm. and I'll be just fine. And she rocked. 
that two hundred dollar wow. dress. Oh, we went yeah. to like nine galas with mm-hmm. it right before we bought her some that more. Is awesome. You know, beautiful. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, another beautiful story too about mm-hmm. how it wasn't the money there. Yeah, we we were in we were in uh, Monaco. We were we were at the Grand Prix there. We got invited to speak on the back of a super yacht. I was speaking there. A bunch of billionaire families there, and one of them was Bernard Vuitton mm. of the Louis Vuitton family. Oh, okay. Right mm-hmm. now, put this into perspective. Vanessa doesn't have any. Louis Vuitton shoes, Louis mm-hmm. Vuitton purses. She's like, why would I spend $5,000, $10,000 on a purse, right? Mm-hmm. We can spend that on helping to rescue the children. And so we were sitting there. This is super funny. He's uh, uh, He heard us speak. He wanted to go to breakfast with us the next morning. So it's just me and Vanessa and Bernard Vuitton. And uh, and he's 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 in his, you know, he's older, maybe in his 60s. And he's going through a bunch of pictures on his phone. He's showing us of modeling pictures when he was in his 20s. Mm-hmm. Now, Vanessa has... She 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 barely heard of Louis Vuitton, right? Mm-hmm, she doesn't mm-hmm. know that they've been around for a hundred and plus years, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And she so so she, he's going through these modeling pictures, and she goes, "Oh, modeling, is that how you got into the fashion business?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and it wasn't until the next day when Bernard invites us to his home to meet mm-hmm. his wife, and we're in his home, and there's this beautiful opulent office, and there's all these black and white pictures of the original Louis Vuitton family. Wow. Vanessa whispers to me, she goes. He didn't start Louis Vuitton. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, you know, to find a woman with that kind of heart, mm-hmm. it wasn't that I was a multi-billion dollar fund manager mm-hmm. that attracted her. What attracted her is the fact that when we met, I was in Haiti. Mm-hmm. It's it's a mess, right? There's a lot of challenges going on there. And I had been there a lot of times and had found the children that ended up being the, the rescue of 34 children. They did a, a documentary on it called Operation Toussaint, which was which followed the, the story of some of these kids. Now, you don't see me because I was still undercover at the time. Mm-hmm. You, you see my, my, my face is blurred when I'm laughing at, with the traffickers at the time. But mm-hmm. those are the missions that I was on and found these children. And she saw that and I saw her heart. And I had done the work on me. In fact, I had gone to a Tony Robbins event. I was super frustrated with the fact that all of my, all of my work, I had started in my mind, through my mouth, through my words and through my actions, created huge companies and foundations, Mm -hmm. but I had never done that from a relationship standpoint. And I had gone through Mm -hmm. two failed marriages and I'm just super frustrated. How do I, how do I fix that part of my life? Mm -hmm. And Tony had, had called me and he said, Paul, hey, I know you know Glenn Beck. I think it'd be great to have him come to my conference. And I called up Glenn. He goes, yeah, that'd be awesome. So we went and picked up Glenn. We went to the Unleash the Power Within. And there's a part of Tony's conference where he has this section where you identify exactly what you want in your business life. You can feel it. You can sense it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he takes you emotionally so that you're there and you can taste it. It's just powerful. I realized I'd never used that in my relationship life. And so I decided, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to write down. And I was, I was with somebody at the time and I wrote down my relationship with this person is, and this is how this person shows up in my life. And a few minutes into it, God said, Paul, don't put anybody in that box, right? You have no ability to use your manifestation skills and change another person. You can create changes in yourself and create an environment that allows them to change, but you don't have the ability to change their free choice. Mm -hmm. So instead, I wrote down my relationship with the woman in my life is, this is how the woman in my life shows up for me. This is how I show up for her in pages and pages and pages. And I found out that very night that the girl I was with wasn't a match. Mm. And less than two months later, I'm in Haiti. And I meet Vanessa and every single thing on that list was there. So I, I joke and I say, yeah, I, I, I created her right <laughs> through that manifestation. Mm-hmm. But she's now the, the executive director of the Child Liberation Foundation. And that has been my passion for the last 10 years. And so that's mm-hmm. where you're, you know, yep. I wanted to bring her into this picture yeah. because, because it's that charity work that brought us together and that's where our true passions are. Mm-hmm. But I can start out way in the past of how that started and get to this place today. I'll tell you what. And uh, anyone that knows me knows that I am an avid yerba mate drinker, over, even over coffee. I'll have my tea. And the fact that she likes yerba mate, I think that's a good sign. <laughs> so, no, I, that's really awesome. She's in the other room as well. So I'm glad you brought her in and, and uh, gave her the kudos also. As far as like where she's not drawn to money or success, she's drawn to these these aspects of life. Like 
there's there's very I don't think I can put into words how important what you're doing with the Child Liberation Foundation is. I have two kids. Anytime I talk about the subject, it affects me. You know, it affects my emotional state affects just because it's hard to imagine helpless humans in those situations. Yeah. How how did you get involved in that? What, you know, what what does that look like? Is cuz when you see it, you can't unsee it. And that's uh, the truth. And that's that's what changed my life mm-hmm. was seeing it for the first time. So I had I had been involved with a lot of charity work. I was I was on the Make a Wish board of directors for seven years. I was the incoming chairman for Make a Wish here in Utah when I got a call from Sean Reyes, our attorney general. Mm-hmm. And he introduced me to the darkest world that I could possibly imagine. And um there's a movie coming out. Angel Studios just picked up the distribution, so I'm hoping it comes out this year. It's called The Sound of Freedom. Mm-hmm. And the real story I'm going to tell you right now mm-hmm. is the the basis for that film. In that film, uh, Jim Caviezel, uh, he played Jesus, Passion of the Christ, Count of Monte Cristo. He plays the part of the Homeland Security agent. Tim. He's one of my favorite actors, by oh, the he's, way. He's awesome. So awesome. good. Awesome. So good in that yeah. film. And uh, the actor who plays me is actually a producer of the film. His name is Eduardo Verastegui. Mm. And because when we filmed the film, I, I was still undercover. And so he couldn't play Paul Hutchinson. So he plays Pablo Delgado, the mm-hmm. billion-dollar fund manager who quits his job to go help rescue kids. And, mm-hmm. and it's a beautiful film. And it starts out with, uh, with the Homeland Security and trying to find these children. We actually took eight different missions that we did and brought them all together into the same storyline. But everything in that film happened, whether it was by some of our operators or myself or Tim or others, everything actually happened. We just brought it all into one storyline with, with what, uh, with what Jim was doing Mm. there, which was powerful. And so here's, here's where I came into the picture. I get a phone call and, um, I am introduced to, uh, this world of child trafficking and I'm asked to help raise some money. There's, there's 20 children in Cartagena that I was told that were being sold for horrible things. Uh, sex trafficking. Uh, these were just children. Mm-hmm. And they needed $50,000 to rescue these children. Now, for me, in my world at the time, you know, $10,000 with Make-A-Wish, I could, I could send a little girl to Disneyland w- with her family, which is important. She's struggling with cancer, right? Mm-hmm. But 50000 here, we could pull 20 children out of hell and get them back to their families. There mm-hmm. just wasn't a comparison. So I says, absolutely, let's figure out how to make that happen. A couple weeks later, I get a phone call. And he said... Uh, He said, Paul, he said, I'm here in Cartagena. He said, there's not just 20 children here. There's more than 50. Mm. And there's more than 100 children tied to the same trafficking rings in other parts of the country. He said, we need to do a simultaneous sting on all three cities at the same time so we can take them all down so the traffickers don't talk to each other and set each other off. Mm. He said, I believe we can rescue over 100 children at the same time on the same day but I need your help in a bigger way. And I said, well, how much do you need? Mm -hmm. He said, I need you. Can you be in Colombia in two days? Whoa. He said, I have to have somebody who can effectively negotiate a multi-million dollar real estate deal with the traffickers, with these guys who are selling the kids. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the the head trafficker down here has has an island, a piece of property inherited from his mother that... He believes he can create a Jeffrey Epstein type island. He can he needs about eight million dollars to build it out, but he can have a bunch of of sex traffic children here and have wealthy men from America and other places fly in and pay big money. He believes he can make tens of millions of dollars a year off this project. He said, Here's our plan. You fly in, you meet with him, and you say, Listen, I'm interested in funding this thing under one condition. We're going to have a party in a couple of weeks. You show up with the children that you control right now, mm-hmm. 50 to 100 children, and um, prove to me you can supply what we need to make this thing work. You prove it. I'm bringing some buddies down. We're going to have a sex party with you. If you can prove it, I'll fund your deal. And I'm sitting there at this table, and this trafficker looks over, and he, he was so excited I was willing to look at his project. He says, Pablo, he said, I have a gift for you. I said, really, what's your gift? He leans forward and he hands me his phone. And there's a picture of an 11-year-old girl on his Mm. phone. He says, this is Princess. She's still a virgin. And he started talking about these horrific things you could do to this little girl. And I thought, 
I thought this is happening. And that my a Navy SEAL that was standing behind me named Dutch, he was like, he 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 says, I need to go check out the 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 neighborhood, make sure everything is right. Later he said, and when we we're debriefing, he said, That little girl looked like my daughter at home. Ooh. He said, I, I almost unholstered my weapon and took him out right there. He said, I could have just and this guy says, Yeah, we just took delivery of something. And something he said he made me realize he had more than her. I said, Fuego. You just took delivery. You have more virgins? He goes, yeah, yeah, we got three or four more. I said, now you're bringing those to the party, right? He goes, oh, no, no. He said, they're too expensive. I said, they're too expensive. I'm already paying $25,000 for this party. Mm -hmm. 25, we were paying them $500 per child for a minimum of 50 children just for two hours in the afternoon. He goes, jefe, he says, you already paid 25,000. You want to F a virgin? It's going to cost you extra 2,000, maybe 5,000 for that little one. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost you maybe 10,000 more. I was so mad. I've got a nice shirt on. I've got a nice watch on. I'm like, mm -hmm. you don't think I can afford an extra $10,000? Mm -hmm. He's like, oh no, Hefe, no. I said, I want every one of mm -hmm. those virgins at my party. I said, they damn well better be virgins when they get there. They're not for you. They're for me. You understand? The stupid little mm -hmm. smile on his face. Because we had to get them out too, right? Yeah. He goes, oh yeah, Hefe, I understand. So two weeks later, we fly back in. These guys meet with the, the federal agents, the, the U.S. Embassy. The Colombian federal agents provided 40 agents for us. Four of them were like our, our maids. Four of them were our waiters and our, our cooks. They're not very good cooks, but they're armed, <laughs> you know. <laughs> 25 were there to storm the party at the right time. Mm -hmm. And these guys showed up with 54 children. Uh, almost every one of them were under the age of 16 years old. More than half of them were kidnapped from other countries. And... Uh, CBS did a little article on it that you can, you know, show the, the, the clips and stuff. But these guys showed up with all these children. We put the children in a separate place in the house. And here's what was super powerful. We were sitting there. We were supposed to, um, once we have undercover cameras, so mm -hmm. they're catching all of the information and whatever. So these, the children never have to stand trial, right? Mm -hmm. We have these traffickers on camera saying exactly why the kids were there and exactly what they're willing to do, et cetera, so that we have all the evidence necessary. After we have all of that on camera, we were supposed to give a sign, you know, order some tequila or something to the to the uh, the waiters. They're mm -hmm. supposed to go back, radio, 22 minutes later, these mm -hmm. guys storm the party and everybody gets arrested and rescue the kids. Mm -hmm. We give this sign, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, right? And the traffickers are like, okay, tequila, we're good to go. Okay, let's start the party, right? Let's say one stands up, I'm just go get the kids. Let's start having the party. And one says, I'll go get the cocaine. And I'm like, we didn't know what was going on. Now, what happened is the, the lady who was in charge of the, the child protective services was supposed to be there on the boat with the, with the agents who were coming in. She like missed the boat, missed her alarm or something that morning. And so she had called and said, don't do this thing till I get there. It was 45 minutes after we had given the sign that they actually showed up. So now Whoa. here's the challenge. What do you do in that 45 minutes? Because they're ready to bring the kids out. You can't blow your cover. Either. How do you deal with that? Right. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they stand up, Hey, let's go get the kids. And this was a divine blessing that I had the opportunity to be there. It wasn't anything special about me, but I have negotiated a whole bunch of business plans. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I said, guys, you know what? if you bring those kids out and stuff, I'm going to be partying for, I, I'm going to be, especially that cocaine, I'm going to be screwed up for the next couple of days. I'm, I'm loving. You guys just proved to me that you could do what I told you to do. Mm -hmm. So why don't we do this? Bring out a piece of paper instead. Let's draw out this business plan, right? Mm. I'm telling you, this was the darkest plan you can imagine. And and uh, Sean Reyes, our attorney general, he was, mm -hmm. it was before he was AG, he was there and he was translating a lot of this. Ask him this question. It was dark. Here's what was scary. This business plan penciled, like it penciled. There was, we asked how much for a child and how much, you know, how much to, for an American child, how much for a Colombian child, how much, whatever. And we put all these down, how much you rent them out for. And, and it was tens of millions of dollars a year coming in off of this project that they had put together. And we learned a lot, really dark stuff that I don't even want to talk here about mm -hmm. what they would do to the kids and everything else. Mm -hmm. And so finally, you know, when the agents came, stormed the party, arrested everybody, 30 child protective services people came in with the children mm -hmm. and they started laughing and singing with the children, just trying to calm them down. And that sound of freedom, this is why the movie is called The Sound of Freedom, mm -hmm. that sound of freedom of those children was the most beautiful sound that I ever heard. 
Mm. especially compared to half an hour before where that little girl, the same one he showed me on the phone, little 11 year old standing up, no taller than I was as I was sitting down and the tear stains in her makeup face shaking. Com- compare that and the sound of those children crying to the, to the laughing and singing that they had there. I started crying mm. and I turned to, to Sean. I said, I, 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 I've been making rich people richer. I want to make a difference. What do you need? I'll write you a big check. And he said to me, he said, Paul, he said, unfortunately, the majority of demand for this horrible act in second and third world countries comes from wealthy, connected guys with egos in first world countries. Mm. He said, I can't teach my Navy SEALs how to wear a $4,000 watch and or suit and a $50,000 watch and negotiate a multimillion dollar deal. He said, and I, I don't know of any ultra successful business owners who's had the training that you've had. He said, if you're willing to be the bait, mm-hmm. I'll change your whole life. Mm. And so since that time, I have been involved with or led over 70 undercover rescue missions in 15 countries and just finished the last ones last year. And I can talk in detail about some of those rescues, some of them mm-hmm. where we got arrested for real by the, and by the wrong cops and you know all kinds mm-hmm. of crazy stories there. The, every, and, and some of them, some of them don't end up with a happy ending. Mm. Some of them, some of the traffickers got away and the children are still there. It's, it's sad. And here's what happened. 10 years ago, when I was on that first rescue mission and that little 11 year old standing in front of me with the tear stains on her makeup face, looking at me like I was the devil, mm. I made a commitment to myself and to God at that moment that I would do everything in my power to eradicate that from the face of the earth. There was nothing more evil that I could think of than somebody selling an 11 year old virgin to a stranger for something like that. I couldn't imagine it was, and at the time it was estimated somewhere around 8 million children were in that situation. And so I thought, whatever it takes, I'm going to raise money. I'm going to do undercover. What do I need to do to make this go away for Mm -hmm. good? And what happened is the end of last year, we had just finished up some rescue missions in in uh, in Ecuador. Took down six different rings down there. Some uh, rescued a bunch of kids, and I looked at the numbers, and I realized there's more children being sold today than there was ten years ago. And so I asked myself, Paul, if your goal in your life is to eradicate this from the face of the earth, then going undercover and pulling twenty children out at a time is not fixing the problem. So I, for a long time, I thought, okay, what is the symptom? What are, what, these are all symptoms. What is the cause? What is the mm-hmm. cause? And for a long time, I thought maybe the cause was pornography addiction. When, mm-hmm. when you take a woman from a divine feminine to an object and you go down a dark road and you get addicted and then you need something harder to have that same fix and some people it's younger and younger, maybe that's the cause of it. I've realized that even that is a symptom just like trafficking, mm-hmm. right? There's a deeper cause to all of it. One child being sold is unacceptable. Eight million is beyond comprehension. Mm -hmm. But that's a tiny number compared to the real problem. Here's the real problem. 40% of all women have been a victim of sexual violence in their life. One fourth of all women have been a victim of sexual violence as a child. Okay. Now the number with men is less. It's about 20%. That's one in every five men have been a victim of that kind of violence. Mm -hmm. And of those about one fourth of them, it, they experienced it under the age of 10 years old, Mm -hmm. most of them in their own homes. So that's approximately 200 million men in this world who were who were a victim of that kind of violence, that Mm. kind of, you know, taking away their innocence as a very young child. And here's what happens. Some of them grow up with just low self-esteem. They're holding it in and they're, you know, not able to really blossom in the way that they could in their life. Others, God bless them, have done the work and have worked through their issues and have gotten to a place that they could shed that trauma from their life and be a good father and a good husband and a good contributor to the world and, and, and not allow that to define them. Unfortunately, there are some who end up being contact offenders themselves Mm. and they, 
they hurt people, hurt other people. What does contact offender mean? Means pass on that trauma, okay, okay, in some way. Whether it is, you know, even even being verbally abusive to a child, mm. physically abusive to a child, or sexually abusive to a child. Okay. So that when you're when you've been raped as an eight-year-old and you grow up and now you have a big ego and you have no regard for other people and you mm -hmm. haven't softened your heart, then what happens, oh, I was raped as a 10-year-old. What does that matter if I rape another 10-year-old? Whatever. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on in some, some people's minds. And so people say, well, okay, well, what do we do? Do we just put them all in prison? No. Okay. Here's, here's the answer. People ask me, Paul, how can you go face to face with somebody selling an eight-year-old and not have them see the anger in your, in your heart and in your face towards them? Mm -hmm. And my answer is, it's because I love them. You can't love them. They're selling a child. No, I love the innocence of the child more, but you can look at every single human being with infinite Christ-like love, infinite, mm -hmm. unconditional love. Now, I'm going to do everything I can to ensure that child is never hurt again. Ensure that that person who has crossed that line never gets to a point where they can hurt another child. However, I can help them see that their past does not define their future, right? Mm -hmm. if, if somebody had childhood trauma, if, if they were physically, verbally, or sexually abused as a child, that does not have to define them today. Every single cell in your body is completely anew less than a year or so later, okay? So the physical you that was there when you were abused is already gone and transformed. The only thing that is holding on to it is right here, your subconscious. So if we can help people heal that trauma, I believe that if you put me in a room mm -hmm. with a hundred pedophiles and a hundred traffickers, and you said, Paul, you have an hour with these guys. You either have a gun with no retribution mm -hmm. or you have a microphone. What would you take? I would take that microphone mm. and that would be the most transformational 60 minutes of their life. I would take them into the pit of hell. I would show them. I would tell them the stories of me seeing eight-year-olds being sold mm. in chains being taken from their families. I have seen it firsthand. I have been in the darkest, deepest recesses of hell. I have seen what happens when people go down that dark road. I would take those that room of men and women to the deepest rest, recesses of hell. I would show them the depravity. I would make every one of them cry. And then I would pull them out and say, okay, now let's talk about what it takes to heal. Hmm. And I believe there's a road to healing for all people. Now they probably still need to stay in prison for mm -hmm. a long time, if not for life. Mm -hmm. Right. But I believe everybody can heal and I can look at them with infinite love and I can help them heal. Now, if we can do that with those people who have already crossed mm -hmm. the line, mm -hmm. what can we do with systems and programs that can help people change the perceptions of themselves, change how they are allowing that trauma to affect their lives. And if we can heal people before they pass that trauma on, then we will not have this generational trauma that is plaguing the world mm -hmm. today. So that's my mission moving forward is the Child Liberation Foundation for many years was here to rescue the, the, a 10-year-old from the clutches of a trafficker in mm -hmm. Ecuador. Today, it's not only that, but it's here to help rescue the 10-year-old inside of every 30, 40, 50-year-old man or woman who still holds on to trauma from when they were a child, helping them heal that, truly learn to love themselves, to forgive themselves and to forgive others so that we can literally help rescue millions of children. Mm. That's powerful. You, uh, you took us through the whole life cycle and uh, you took us even through that stage of how to get to that Christ level of consciousness, even in those, the darkest situations. Um, I, wanna, I want to bring it back to the beginning of that and ask you, how do you get into the right mindset for those situations? What is your psychology like? When I'm going before, into mm -hmm. undercover work, mm -hmm. it goes back to what we spoke about before. Mm -hmm. We're in fear and faith mm -hmm. cannot exist in the same person at the same time, mm -hmm. right? When you have unwavering conviction about something, unwavering, 
You know, John chapter five talks about having faith unwavering. That's the, the key word there is unwavering. Mm-hmm. And faith, a lot of people think that faith is a religious term. Faith is a universal law. It's the most powerful law in the universe. Mm-hmm. And it's simply this, it's the unwavering conviction that what I want to have happen will happen. People have a hard time with unwavering conviction about anything. Mm-hmm. Should I marry this woman? Should I start this new job? Should I move to this new city? Whatever. And it's because they don't know if it's in line with what their God wants, mm-hmm. right? In these situations, when we're doing undercover work, it is easy for me to have that unwavering conviction because I don't care if you believe that God is a, a man or a woman or a mountain or a cloud or a universe or a whatever. It doesn't matter. There's no higher power in the universe that's okay with an eight-year-old being raped, Mm -mm. period, right? Mm -hmm. So it's easy for me to have unwavering conviction that the powers of God and the powers of the universe will come into play and will lead me to them and will keep me safe every Mm -hmm. time. And so by having that unwavering conviction, I can move forward. I I, I had a a talk with some... some, uh, uh, Navy SEALs that were on the first time they were doing under, undercover with me. And they said, Paul, I want to see what you do. How do you do this? And I, I told them this story. I told them about the unwavering conviction. And they're like, okay. I said, and and I said, you, you've seen the movie Finding Dory? You know, Finding Nemo, the second one, Finding Dory, this stupid mm-hmm. fish with a two-second memory, right? <laughs> and her face, her, her, her parents are somewhere in the ocean complex and she just keeps on swimming and per- pretty soon she finds them. I said, guys, mm-hmm. I might operate like Dory tonight. (laughs) They're like, what? I said, because I'm not going to follow logic and protocol. I'm listening. As Mm. I put my hand on my heart, I'm listening here. And uh, I said, I said, every single one of these rescue missions, that's what, that, that's what it's about. It's about listening. In fact, um, just one last year, uh, recently, uh, we were, we were, uh, we were in Ecuador Mm-hmm. And the federal agents asked us to come and follow up with some leads, and um, and they there was a a little girl that we had uh, already worked with that was in the hospital. She had gotten beat up by some of the traffickers. She was taken, and she was told that she needed to earn a thousand dollars a day, otherwise she'd get beat up. This was the third time that she'd gotten beat up, and this was so bad she was in the hospital. So we were able to extract enough information to find out this this area that she was in. And so the the, the federal agents take me and, and a couple of my guys, and they drop us off into this area downtown. They said, this is, this is the area that she said that she was in, is this area downtown that she was being trafficked. We said, okay. They said, just, just see what you can find down here. So we, we, we get out and there's this courtyard and I'm, I'm, I'm standing there in the middle of the courtyard and there's drug dealer, drug dealer, prostitute, prostitute, just kind of, you know, it's a seedy area of town. And I'm just listening with my heart, just listening. And I'm looking around, nothing feels right. Nothing feels right. And then I, I look down this alley and there was this, this girl that was kind of leaning back against a wall with her foot up against the wall. And immediately I felt it. That's mm-hmm. it right there. So I grabbed one of my guys. I said, come here. Let's come, come with me real quick. And we go up there. And this is the kind of thing that happens every time, right? Mm-hmm. We go up there and I, and I say, como se llama? And she answers that, Effie, Effie. <laughs> you know, that's your oh, name, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm like, um, and, and she, uh, she says, GS dollars, $10. Wow. So horrible, how seedy, you know? And, and I, I pull out a $20 bill. And she goes, oh, dos Effie, Effie? And oh I says, no. Gosh. I said, I said, uh, I said in my broken Spanish, I said, mm-hmm. I, I've got, I've got a friend coming down looking for uh, you know, something he can't get in the U.S., you know, mm-hmm. if you have some connections with some younger. She goes, oh, no, I don't know anything about it. Okay, okay, okay. I just put the money back in my pocket. And I went back down to the courtyard with the other guys, and less than two minutes later, she comes down. And she's pointing at me. She's, come here, come here, come here. I go over, and she goes, follow me. And we go down this alley, this different alley around the corner. I went with one of the guys, and we come up, and there's these, these two big wooden doors, and these guys out in front folding their arms, big dudes, and uh, an old crappy sign that said hostel over the top. It wasn't a hostel. This mm-hmm. was a front for a brothel for mm-hmm. children. Wow. Right. And uh, tell them what we're looking for. And they open the door and there's some children right there, right there. I said, yep, that's what my boss wants. Yep, exactly. We geotag the location. I exchanged contact information with him, went back to the, uh, made sure we weren't being followed, went back to the undercover van, got in, told the federal agent, showed them the place. And they said, oh, that's exactly where she said she was being sold. They didn't tell me exactly. It was an eight block area, right? Mm-hmm. And, and less than five minutes after being there, by listening, 
finding the right person, we were being led there. Then the next one is super powerful. They said, okay, now we're going to go and uh, there's a place we, we got some leads on. There's this, this uh, uh, spa that does nares and hair, hair and stuff, but they had a massage place in the back that was doing selling children out of it. It was a front for, for this place selling children. So we, uh, they drove around the city and got to this other place and then that federal agent goes, oh, crap. Yeah. I said, what? He says, it's closed down. They've already, they, they must have got tipped off that we were coming. It's, the whole place is closed. The spa's not even there anymore. And I said, no, stop. Because I could feel it. I could feel it. In my, I knew there were still children there. I knew it. He says, stop. This is, why? I said, stop. I can feel it. They're still here. And this is what happens when you're, when you're following unwavering faith and coming from a place of pure integrity, you'll be able to be more sensitive to those intuitions in every area of your life. And so, so he says, okay, he stops and I get out. And uh, one of the, the Green Berets, uh, Petter, that was there with us, he opens the door and a couple of my, my operators get out. I get out and I go to the back of the van and I'm just, I'm just listening from the heart. I'm just listening. I'm looking back and forth. I'm looking at this place that, this, that, that the kids used to be, this, this spa area. And, uh, and there was a restaurant that was on the left-hand side. And I, I, I felt I need to go in there. I went into the restaurant and I went right to the manager. And I said, hey, I'm, uh, I'm supposed to, my friends told me about a massage place here. I said, is this still here? And he said, you got an appointment? Freaking knew that place was mm -hmm. still there, right? Mm -hmm. I said, no, I don't have an appointment. He goes, oh, I don't know anything about it. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, for your. Mm -hmm. So I went out front, different people walking by and I'm just listening. And nothing out of the ordinary other than there was this lady that was walking and she, she felt differently to me. She was walking her dog. I walked over to the lady. And I said, hey, I said, uh, you can help me with something. And she goes, what? I said, I, um, I have an appointment for a massage here. I don't, even, I don't even know, but it, it looks like they closed down. She goes, you have an appointment? I kind of lied. I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she makes a phone call. And a few minutes later, these big steel doors open. This madam is there. Me and my operators go in. Tell her what we're looking for. She takes us up and around. We knew we were being watched. And, uh, um, but she takes us back to this back area. And then there's this center um, foyer. And there was rooms all around the foyer with massage beds and queen size mattresses in each one of them. And then she pulls out a menu. This menu has pictures of children and has specifics about the things that you want to get and how much each one of them would cost. Mm. And I said, yep, that's what my boss is looking for. You know, we exchanged contact information. The feds were able to shut her down, shut the other ones down, rescued a whole bunch of kids right after we left because we were able to get in and find that information. Mm -hmm. This happens on every single rescue. And as long as you're in a place of complete unconditional love and unwavering faith, you're protected and you're led in areas that you could never imagine. After hearing all that, I feel compelled to ask, what is the mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual toll that you have to pay in, in this position? What's the tax that you have to pay to do this? You've got to be in a really good place from a spiritual standpoint to be able to go into the recesses of hell like that. Mm -hmm. I've seen guys go in there and they come out and it, it affects them. In both ways, either, you know, they're, they're sick to their stomach or they, you know, they just can't deal with it emotionally. Others come out of it with a really unhealthy ego boost. Hmm. Like, like, you know, I mm -hmm. freaking did that, you know, and, and, uh, and that unhealthy ego boost shows up in, in all their relationships, how they treat other people. It's mm -hmm. just, just this negativity just, just eats at them. And, um. A few years, about six years ago, and this was part of my transformation to qualify for a finally a healthy relationship. Mm. I um, it was one of my undercover operators came to me and he said, Paul, he said, uh, do you trust me? I said, yeah, you know, we do a lot of undercover stuff. Of course I trust you with my life. He said, um, he says, I found something that's helping me a lot in getting rid of some of that negative energy and uh, 
that trauma we're holding on to. And I'm like, I don't hold on to the trauma. I'm Paul F. And Hutchinson, right? You know, mm-hmm. but my trauma was being held on to in that negative way, like I was saying. You know, an unhealthy ego and you know unhealthy relationships. You know, I was I was in my my second marriage that just was you know not working where it needed to be, et cetera. There was just a lot of things in my life that were that was because of how I was showing up or not showing up in my life. It was completely my doing, and uh, so he brought me into a guided meditation transformational experience that changed everything for me. Uh, a deep dive into, you know, an, a non-conventional, I, you know, I could, therapists weren't helping me because hmm. my, my trauma was self-imposed. Hmm. I wasn't Paul Hutchinson. I was Paul F. and Hutchinson, right? Built mm-hmm. a multi-billion dollar company and I rescued mm-hmm. the kids and this is, you know, I was super mm-hmm. unhealthy. And I would go into to therapy offices and I, I'd tell the therapist why I was so cool. You know, <laughs> that's just how I was, right? <laughs> so, so, being able to put me into a place where through a holistic uh, approach was able to put me into a deep theta state with some mm-hmm. some sound bowls and some other other modalities i was able to completely transform my life in ways that, i mean for example i felt in one of these guided meditation transformational experiences i the the facilitator took me to a place where I could feel in every single cell in my body, I could feel the pain that my children experienced when I cheated on their mom, mm. right? I could feel it. It was so dark and it was so heavy. I thought I was going to die. I couldn't even breathe. The, the, the depths of hell is where I was. I could feel myself so deep down in the earth. It was black. It was heavy. It was dark. It was so much pressure. And I, uh, I, I had these, these headphones on. I was listening to this, what I call journey music, you know, that was taking me there and I was going through my, and, and then I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. And so I switched my playlist to what I call my Jesus list, <laughs> right? <laughs> it was some beautiful music and mm-hmm. I could feel myself being transformed as I just, ugh, all of that crap that was just chains that were holding me down was there. And then boom, I flipped it back and I could go back down and I could feel the negativity that was being attached to me from being in those situations of, of the child trafficking type scenarios and stuff. And I was just, you know, I could feel the pain of those children and, and I, I, it was so dark and so heavy. And then I changed it back to my music again and it pulled me out and I could, I could feel that transformation of, of, of letting go the decisions that I made of the past, letting go of the negative energy that other people had placed on me, letting go of that negativity of being in some of those situations. And it was so transformational in so many ways that I was now able to see a clear path to a healthy relationship, to, to a healthy connection with, with everybody around me, and most importantly, a healthy relationship with myself mm. that wasn't based on ego and pride and, and fear, but it was, it was based on love and true forgiveness, forgiveness for myself mm. for those stupid things that I did, forgiveness for other people, for the stupid things that they did when they were out of integrity and being able to get to a place where we could all move forward into the space of healing. Hmm. So Paul, let's talk, let's talk about the mechanics of that uh, meditation and the different modalities that have helped you. Back in the late sixties, there were a lot of things that were thrown under the bus by the U S government, um, classified as uh, schedule one. Uh, drugs, uh, put in the same classification as cocaine and and uh, heroin and some really horrible things. What I'm talking about is things like uh, psilocybin and white lily and sassafras and mistletoe, different types of, of psychedelic type medicines. When my undercover operator told me about it, you know, we had to go to Mexico or Peru or Colombia or Me- um, and uh, Costa Rica to be able to have these these experiences legally, mm-hmm. um, because you know there's more dangerous to have that than it was to have whatever other to rob a bank. You know, you can go mm-hmm. to jail for just as long for having these things. And wow. John Hopkins University did a study 
a bunch of studies recently and found that 76% of people who experience one of these guided meditation, plant medicine facilitated transformational experience, 76% of them said it was the most, the number mm -hmm. one most transformational experience of their life. Mm -hmm. And almost 100% of them said it was within the top five mm -hmm. most transformational experiences of their life. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I was brought into one of these, and there's, there's a lot of different modalities. You don't have to, um, you don't have to use a, a, a psychedelic experience to be able to pull you through, but it's a lot more difficult. And we use, in some of our, our transformational experiences, we use uh, uh, equine therapy, you know, horses and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a great group in Southern Utah called uh, the Rewilding Experience, Mustang Ranch down there. Amazing transformation. You go in for four days, you do breath work, and I'm telling you, breath work can release as much DMT in your system as, as using plant medicine. Mm -hmm. Super powerful. When you have a, a person who really understands how to take you there and bring you to that place of, of putting you into that theta state and, 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 and changing your perspective of, of life as a whole, it's super powerful. So mm -hmm. we've used, uh, we have practitioners that, that have studied in Latin America on drum healing you know, mm -hmm. on, on the sound bowl healing, on breath work healing, on ecstatic dance type healing. There's a lot of different things that you can do as part of these experiences to transform. And uh, there's a lot of places throughout uh, Latin America, a lot of them, that you can go for a transformational experience. In fact, we're putting one together now. We're, we're called it, we're calling it Libertadores. It means the liberators in Spanish, right? <laughs> <laughs> Libertadores healing. Ranch, and uh, it's 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 going to allow uh, twenty to thirty people to come at one time. What part of South America? Uh, we're in uh, the Yucatan in Mexico. Oh, okay. We're looking at right now. Okay. So Central America. Yeah, Central America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not South mm -hmm. America. In in these experiences, we will. Um, in fact, I'll go into detail as to what we do in some of these transformational experiences. Mm -hmm. Number one, there are people who will use some of these uh, plant medicine tools is, is recreational stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't judge them, but I kind of do mm -hmm. because they're, but this isn't what we're talking about, the, right? These things yeah. are so powerful mm -hmm. when used correctly that you need to set sacred space as I call it. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I make sure that everybody that comes in, comes in with a very clear intention an intention of, of, what a 2.0 version of yourself needs to look like, you know, whether it's, whether it's, it's breaking free of, of an addiction, you know, pornography addiction, or whether it's, it's learning how to really embrace self-love and forgive yourself or forgive other people. Maybe it's letting go of some childhood trauma, whether, whether it's learning to live in the, in the presence in every moment, whether it's letting go of anger issues that are plaguing you, whatever it is, identify something very specific that you want to work on. And, and how I like to look at it is this. Imagine you've, you've got this, this, this maze. You've got the start and the finish line, right? And, and you're trying in your conscious world, trying to get to this finish line. This finish, finish line might be breaking free of that addiction or self-love or getting over the, the trauma of losing a loved one or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't quite get there. During this experience with, uh, with psilocybin or others, you're able to have that, that route light up beautifully and you're able to get to that place of self-love or let go of that trauma in a really beautiful way. So that then a week later, a month later, a day later, whenever, if, if you start having some of those same thoughts and this, you know how to get to that place of letting that go. They, they've done scientific experiments shown that you put the, uh, you know, some brain cells and some of these, these psychedelics in there, they actually start growing some new dendrites, mm -hmm. right? There's some mm -hmm. actual physical things that are happening to mm -hmm. open up your, your consciousness to a point where you can connect with God, connect with your mm -hmm. higher self, forgive yourself and do all of this beautiful work where I, I've seen 10 and 20 years of therapy being done in 24 to 48 hours. Super powerful. <sighs> So powerful. What, what you're saying is so important. There's not many things you can do in your day-to-day -day life that can take you out of this kind of habituation of our patterning and our thoughts and everything. It's like, 
if you were to imagine non-ordinary states, like what you're talking about is like pulling you out of this uh, box that you're living in. It's very hard to articulate, but some brain scans and M MRIs have kind of shown this, which is regions of your brain that are generally dormant light up like fireworks. Yeah. And so you're making connections. And for me, anytime I've taken a plant medicine journey or, or gone through some, some sort of uh, therapy, right? Mm -hmm. Medicinal therapy like this. It's allowed me to make connections and have epiphanies and break through limiting beliefs or uh, self-deprecating thoughts or thoughts of I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. And so almost every, every time I have taken this uh, a plant medicine, I have had a breakthrough in a positive way. And it, it has left me in a positive state for over two years, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it, it's powerful that you've come to this realization or you are, you're embarking on this new journey of retreats and helping others heal. Cause ultimately that's what you're doing. That's what it's all about is healing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, there's, my goal is, and we can't create retreats for 8 billion people, you know, mm -hmm. that's why I'm on the podcast and speaking if, and mm -hmm. I'm writing a book called, Are You Listening? That should be coming out in, in the next little while. We're going to build that out into some, some beautiful tools that people can use for healing. So mm -hmm. they'll have the tools that they can use from home to start changing their, their negative habit patterns of thought, similar to what we did with the anxiety company in my early 20s. We had a cognitive restructuring, change the way that you think and you process things and literally change your life. Mm -hmm. So that's for the masses. Mm -hmm. But then there are people who are like, you know what? I want a transformational experience. I, I want to I wanna really get some work done. And so that's where these healing retreats are. And we're, we're, we're going to be building. My goal mm -hmm. is over the next few years to have, to have retreats all around the world. We're looking at some space in Italy right now. We're looking at a couple different ones in Latin America. And, uh, and, and eventually, you know, we'll have some here in the U.S. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, the ones that we have here in the U.S. are, are doing uh, holistic therapy. They're mm -hmm. not doing the plant medicine stuff yet, but we have some other holistic stuff. But that's something that's very quickly going to be coming. Uh, I believe that the FDA will start approving some of these, these tools, these plant medicines, by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. In fact, our goal was to get Utah to be one of the first states to legalize it. We had some, some great bills that were coming through and it was going to be within certain parameters. We actually mm -hmm. took some Utah doctors and some pretty prominent active Utah religious leaders, mm -hmm. some bishops to Jamaica, fully legal there. The church doesn't have, the, the, the prominent church here doesn't have any, any negative things about using different types of herbs. They just say, you know, keep the law, you know, if mm -hmm. it's against the law. So, you know, they don't have anything specific, but especially when it has to do with, with trauma healing, et cetera. So we took these active bishops and, and some, uh, some doctors to Jamaica to have their first experience. Now I will tell you this, this is super <laughs> important. It was a two night, two, two night event. Mm -hmm. The very first one, we, we, we we had it more of a, some of the doctors that were there wanted to kind of set it up as a clinical type of an environment. So they had everybody kind of laying on their, their cushions. They said, you know, don't get up, don't talk to anybody, just kind of internalize it all and work through it. And it was super heavy and it was super dark mm -hmm. to deal with that on their own. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, me and Jimmy, who mm -hmm. Jimmy Rex, who we were helping to sponsor it, we said, let's, we've, we've done a lot of these mm -hmm. and we really know how to make it work in a beautiful way to help people transform their life. So we're going to start out with doing what we call a heart opener, you know, some mm -hmm. cacao type of a thing, something that's a beautiful heart opening space. We're going to then do some sound bowl stuff to really get you into this beautiful space. You're, you know, when you, when you, everybody's going to take their, their little drink of the, the, uh, the mushroom and stuff. And then mm -hmm. we're all going to lay down and get into this beautiful space of being able to just feel the energy. But then after you drop in, Get up, go outside, look at the sunset, connect with nature and, and, and feel the community of the loving people that are here as part of this group, these 20 people that are here. And if you feel called to share some of the things, share it. If you don't just listen and just, just be a part of this, this loving container. Mm -hmm. And that second night was the most transformational experience of most of their lives. And so it's so important that it's not just, hey, I'm on my own. I'm going to take some mushrooms and see what happens. No, having a, a trained facilitator, 
understanding the different modalities of, of using sound bowls and drum healing, et cetera, and then being able to communicate and work through some of those things with a living, breathing, loving human being who is there with you. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. In fact, way back 20 plus years ago, mm -hmm. when I had the Attacking Anxiety and Depression program, the, the, we had so many people that had the workbook that the very thing that they were fighting stopped them from overcoming it. It was the negative self-talk. I don't believe that I can get through this. And so the, they have the tools, but they wouldn't believe it. And so we put together a personal coaching program and our coaches were not therapists and psychiatrists. Our coaches were people who had been through it before, mm. who had overcome it, that give them the most important ingredient, which was belief. Mm. You give them belief in themselves that they can, now they can use those tools and move forward. Same thing in these healing journeys, by bringing in a container of people who, different people who have experienced different things in their life, that, that together can create that value in each other's healing experience and give them that belief and the support that they need to move forward. That's where transformation happens. Mm. It's so true. What would you say to the person on the fence right now? If the person's on the I would fence. Say, I would say read, read a book called Change Your Mind or read a book called The Immortality Key. Hmm. Both of them have lots of scientific backing behind them and, and will help you see it from a different light, number one. Number two, most people that are on the fence is just because they've been trained for the last 50 years that these things are as bad as cocaine. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is just super silly. They're just, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're not there. There's never been cases of, of, you know, you don't get, get addicted. There's no overdose and they're super transformational and make sure that you find a trained facilitator who knows how to work with the medicine, how to, how to help people through the trauma. You know, we, we, uh, we host these a lot, you know, we're, we're, we're going down to Mexico next week and, uh, we, we love bringing people into this world of transformational healing. Now, here's something super beautiful too. If you take the time to heal, and this, this, is, this, is, my, this is my little secret method of, of, of healing the world, okay? So here's how you heal the world in one lifetime, mm -hmm. right? And then I'll c condense it down to only a few years. <laughs> so if you take an entire year mm -hmm. to heal yourself, or you take some of these tools and heal yourself. And then next year, you take an entire year and between all the other things you're doing, you simply help two people heal, right? You help them heal from their trauma, come into a beautiful new place, everything. You help them shed all of that and heal. Then they make the commitment that the next year they're going to help two people heal. So now they've got four people that they're helping heal that next year. 33 years, you're over 8 billion people. Wow. Right? That's the power of compounding interest, mm, right? And so powerful. if you can help somebody heal and it takes a whole month, you bring them into one of these healing journey experiences, mm -hmm. you you come in for a week or two and they, they do a transformational thing and then they go and they help some other people, they help two people heal. It's 33 months, not years, that we hit 8 billion people. It's just a matter of really, truly finding a way to pass it on. In the, in the, the Alcoholics Anonymous program, Two of the real keys there is number one, a connection with a higher power, you know, your connection with God. And another one that, that if you don't do this, your chances of falling back into being an addict are pretty high. One of the last keys to success is helping somebody else overcome their addiction, right? Mm -hmm. it's, that, it's that once you've transformed yourself, being able to go and help others, that's what's going to change the vibration of all mankind. It's going to help heal the world, and that will help rescue millions of children. What? Um, where can people find you? What you know? Do they go to your website? Do they go to, you know, is it one place that they can go, or yeah, so, is there multiple places? So, um, I had for a long time. I had Paul Hutchinson official, mm -hmm. just because there was a lot of Paul Hutchinsons, you know. So. But I, I don't want to be a celebrity, right? I don't need that official. So we're we're actually trying to rebrand, but I will say that whatever the rebrand looks like, mm -hmm. you can go to Soul Healer 007 mm -hmm. and it will either be the website or it'll point you to it. The book coming out will be called Are You Listening? Mm -hmm. And talking about the first step to healing is- Do you have a release date? 
Um, it should be within the next two months. We're we're in the okay. final phases of putting it all together, and so super excited about that. That mm-hmm. that will be all about learning how to listen to your heart and transforming your life through that that realizing that every one of us were born with the ability to feel and recognize the spirit of truth mm-hmm. and and goes through a number of them. I just told a couple of them, one of them here of listening to find those children, but it goes through a number of the stories where where it was absolute divine intervention. It was learning to listen to that intuition, that still small voice of truth within our hearts that were able to lead us exactly to where those children were every single time. Mm. So that's awesome. And then how you can use those same tools mm-hmm. to to help lead your life into a place of total personal transformation, whether it's abundance financially, whether it's abundance in your your relationship life, whatever it is that you're searching to have a more fulfilled life by learning to listen, that's going to transform it. So true. Deep listening is a is a lost art and it's a skill that will transform everybody's life. Yeah. People need to listen better, active listening. All right, guys, if you, we brought you any value today, like, subscribe, and share this with your friends. Share this with anyone that you think needs to hear the wisdom from 007 in the flesh, the real life soul healer 007. Man, I mean, we could have gone for another three hours easy. So, but uh, I think I think we're good for now. Let's, let's do a round two in the near future. But uh, we'll see you guys next time. Peace.